Every time a rock is struck, dust and particles are removed. Wear eye protection and take extreme caution not to breathe the dust. The dust will get into your lungs and act like they were tiny razor blades, and this can lead to serious permanent health problems including death. Hi there, my name is John McPherson, and in this videotape I'm going to show you how to predictably remove flakes from rock. And as a result, you'll have flakes to use as tool, or you'll be able to use the rock you've left behind as a tool. I've spent a quarter of a century flint napping. I didn't learn very fast. But lately, I've come to grips with exactly what I'm doing. And by taking it back to its very basic form, to me, flint napping has come very simple. It's come a very simple concept. And I can get this across to you. I'm doing so here in this videotape. There's one basic rule of physics that defines everything I'm going to show you here. This one rule has five or six sub rules and maybe four or five six sub rules beyond that that all come from the one rule one basic rule and I'm going to show you how they all tie together I'll show you the rules one at a time work through show how they derive from the one basic rule and when you see these see this how everything derives from one rule, which you can see and define. The concept of taking a rock and turning it into a tool will become simple to you. There are two basic means of removing flakes. One is called direct percussion, where you strike a rock with another rock or an antler or some sort of percussing device. And as you strike it, you transfer energy through your flint-type rock. The other is called pressure flaking, where you take a tool of antler, or bone, uh, copper, a nail maybe, and you will push flakes off of a stone. Now, I'm not going to cover this pressure flaking at all in this videotape. And just about everyone that I've ever met who's involved in flint napping learned pressure flaking first. Pressure flaking is the final stages of flint napping. It's what you do towards the end. Uh, seldom do you need it in between. You can make perfectly fine functional stone tools without ever learning pressure flaking. And yet if you learn pressure flaking first you get locked into a concept of flint napping that will slow your growing. It, it just slows down your learning of the base of flint napping, which is what we're going to cover here. And once you have a good solid base behind you, you'll climb up that pyramid towards the point and remove flakes regularly where you want them to come off, they will. What I'm going to do right now is go through a real quick science lesson. 
What I'm going to explain to you throughout this videotape is science, it's fact. And what I'm going to explain to you right now is my interpretation of the makeup and composition of rock, which I've been informed by a fellow who just looked at this tape, he said this is not fact. So really what I'm calling a science lesson right now is not. But it's my interpretation of how this energy is being transferred through the rock. And if you can understand, if you get it here, if you get what I see, and you take that information and ingrain it in your head, and then the rules that I show you later, they're rules, the principles of physics, they're true. You'll understand how they happen. What I'm seeing is, let's take this and make it a block of flint. I see this flint being made up of millions and millions of not randomly placed molecules. So here's what we end up with. A nice little <laughs> unruly block of flint, but see that arrowhead in there? Just waiting to be taken out of it. I'm going to show you how to get into that. And remember when I describe this makeup, scientists will probably laugh at me. It makes no difference. What you need to do is just understand what I'm seeing because it's going to relate to the true facts that are to follow. What we end up with here is with all these molecules placed exactly the same throughout, you end up with the closest I can compare it to it be like a bowl of jelly where if you push in from one side it reacts the same no matter what direction you push from. Uh, it's just, it's all of one. Homogeneous is the word. You don't need to know the word. What you need to know is the principle that I'm going to show you. Now, when you take a flint type rock, glass, jaspers, agates, true flint, church, one thing they have in common is the way they fracture, the way they break. And if energy is applied from any direction, once that hits, that energy is transferred off into a cone. Once it strikes, it changes direction, and it also becomes, it's a cone. This, this is a fact. This is true. So no matter whatever direction we apply energy from, once it hits, the instant that it hits, it transfers that energy off into a cone. So it doesn't make any difference where that energy is coming from. The instant that it strikes, it transfers it. We can control this. This angle here is known. See, the angle where this strikes down, all this, you'll learn as we go through this videotape. We'll learn what these angles are, and that will tell us that if we strike a blow this way, that when that transfers off like this, we can remove a flake. And this is what this, the purpose of this videotape is about, is to teach you how to predictably remove flakes from stone. So what I've shown you, this cone, this cone is the one rule in flint napping. All other rules that I'm going to show you in this videotape, which will build the base, the solid base that you'll need, will derive from this cone. And once they all come together, you'll have it. Bingo. You find me repeating a lot of repetition, this repetition of what concept, or what rule I'm following. By the end of this, you'll, you'll look at it, and I'm confident that you'll walk away and say, yeah, I think I can go out and break some rock. Know a little bit about what I'm doing. This is the one rule of flint napping 
that I'm describing, all other rules derive from. This is actually, it's a piece of obsidian, a large flake, that has been struck with a, by a BB. And as a result of it, this cone has been removed. And this cone dictates every other rule we're going to cross today. Uh, it's just, it's so simple it's hard. Uh, it's, it, there's a lot of rules that come out of this cone, but once you understand exactly what I'm saying, once you get this in your head, bingo, wow, you're going to say, yes, yes, I see it, and you'll, you'll be able to go at it. This cone is the root of all the rules and flit napping I'm going to cover in this videotape. And when explaining this to audiences, and a lot of times even to individuals, I found that this cone's not large enough to do the trick. So, what I had done is build me a cone out of paper. The advantage I find to this is I can lay it alongside of a rock and really illustrate to a person who's interested exactly what's happening when my energy comes down. This makes a training aid, not just for other people, but for yourself or myself. It, it's something I can lay alongside the stone that I'm working on, and I can pick a point where, where maybe I'll move a flake off of this corner. Things look right to me, you know. Lay that on the top of that cone and look and say, well, yeah, there's really not a lot of reason why you can't do that. It's maybe got some ifs to it, but I can move it over to this corner and do the same. So, oh yeah, this is even better. I've got my energy going to transfer off there. I've got plenty of room right here in the point to have a solid hit to transfer my energy. We lay our cone along a straight edge like this, we'll see that if the cone is what's being removed, in order for us to remove anything, we actually have to dig inside of that stone, gouge a hole out through there. When you try to gouge out inside of a rock, the problem is that on either side, you're gouging in, that rock is holding your cone together. You can't really knock a cone out like a BB can on a piece of glass. That just, we can't do that flint napping. You'll learn that by watching this tape that you'll be working on little sticky outies, little corners, appendages. That's where your flakes will come off. If we lay this edge, this appendage edge, along the top of our cone, I almost got to get the stick out of the way. What's being said here is we're talking angle. We get the angle right for the flake to come off, but we don't have anything left to strike. We don't have a platform. When our blow would come down, right where my finger's shooting, it would skim. It wouldn't have anything to grab onto, anything to bounce into. If we turn turn this angle back so we have something to actually strike on, well, then our energy is going too deep into the stone. Ideally, what we're working towards is our flake energy will skim the surface. There'll be time for different tools we'll dig deeper in, but we can't really gouge out. See, what we're doing is removing the cone. Our energy, the flake that we're removing is actually inside of this cone. Now I refer to the flake as coming from inside the cone. And so actually your cone needs to be further up into the rock. You have to envision this. Let me see if I can explain this a little bit better. The inside of the flake is the outside of the cone. 
let's just take a little bit different look at this cone. Here you can really see what we're talking about. That cone, all of that cone is going out in space into nowhere. In the Never Never Land. Here's where that flake came off. So it really actually removed a slice of that cone. The inside of the flake is now the outside of this rock. So the outside of our flake was the outside of the rock. So now this will give you some sort of visualization of how that cone fits. This is what we removed. Just a little chunk of cone. What we're looking at here are biphase points. Here's a, a bifacial preform. And here would be something similar to that taken a little further in the thinning process. And then we have a few finished pieces here from the there's one thing that all these pieces have in common from your larger preform which has just been roughed out to your smaller finished pieces each one of these pieces was made by removing one flake at a time flakes those things we're removing from the rack. Big ones are called spalls. The little bitty dinky ones, well, they're called chips. In between, what you'll be seeing most of in this video are flakes. Where the cutoff between a flake and a chip is, or a flake and a small is, now it's not real distinct. Spalls are bigger and chips are smaller. So we'll talk a little bit about our tools. Here's some of our percussing instruments, percussors, percussees. Uh, I do a lot, awful lot of work with a really small size hammer stone. You'll see as we go along, and, uh, and then maybe a bit more with the medium-sized ones. Um, they've got their place. We'll cover them a little bit better detail. And a baton, uh, a billet out of uh, antler. This here's moose. It could be deer, elk. And it could be small, it could be larger. Uh, these have a, a place also in our flint napping and our percussion flaking, which we'll, we'll work more on this a little bit later too. thing I don't like working with batons quite so much, though they have a lot of benefits, is the fact is that in a truly primitive survival situation, you're more likely to come across a, a rock that would be more suitable than, than you would a piece of antler. And then we have a much larger hammer stone, and they can become much larger than this. Uh, these are cumbersome to work uh, under general purposes, but if you're removing uh, larger spalls off of uh, big pieces of flint, then you'll want something this size or even larger. What really are we looking for for quality in a hammer stone? I like something that fits my hand, uh, kind of roundish, not always uh, have to be perfectly round. Uh, something that you can fit into your hand. And the consistency of it is I like to be able to take, and when I rub the hammer stone on my jeans, 
I feel kind of a little gripping, uh, almost like a sandpaper, not real, real sandy, but more of a gripping, where your harder hammer stones are uh, more glass-like. They transfer energy differently than a softer one, such as this, where uh, an antler uh, billet uh, being soft also. What happens is these softer stones, they grip the edge of the flint as you strike just momentarily. It, it allows that transfer of energy to go through. And you really want to work with the size of stone, it, it, it's comfortable for the size of the rock that you're hitting on. Now this large stone here is pretty awkward for me to try to, to swing and knock flakes off of this stone here. I can do it, yes, but I'm having trouble controlling the hammer stone, where if I was working on a much larger sized rock, if, I, if this uh, rock here was much larger, then it would justify the amount of weight that I have here and I could swing it down and have more of a transfer of energy. I'd be more comfortable with what I was doing. Now the relationship between the size of the hammer stone to the rock that you're working with, you, you need enough force or weight in your hammer stone so when you strike your core rock that the flake will be removed. Uh, and if you're working with a really small stone on a large rock, and then you lose control because you have to swing your hammer stone so hard, because like you're liable to break your hammer stone. But see, if a flake wants, if the rock is set right and the rules are followed, well, the flake wants to come off. And so you can conceivably work a larger stone to an extent with a smaller hammer stone. Uh, you're just not as comfortable with what you're doing. So when you, when you strike, you want to follow through on your blow. You don't want to peck at it. You want to swing and come from above and swing down. Um, so that when, you, when you strike your rock, the flake will come off. If you're doing your job right, the hammer stone will do it. With this size of rock, I find that a little bit larger stone makes it easier for me than, one, than the one we just worked with because I don't have to swing it quite so hard. Uh, I still want the same follow through when I strike. I want my blow to go through. I don't want to ever just peck at it. Follow through. If flake wants to come off, it's going to come off. Just a follow through blow. Accuracy counts. Where you strike this rock onto here, you're seeing, your view is not what I'm seeing. I'll show you some above views on these blows here a little later on in this video. But I can't see where this is striking. I have to actually physically look over and see where is that point at. And then experience tells me where I'm hitting. You see exactly where that's hitting. See, And because accuracy is important, I need to be more in control of my hammer stone. If it's too big and bulky, and then I, I'm, I'm stumbling around with it, and if it's too small and lightweight, and then I'm swinging too hard, and it makes it harder for me to find the right spot to hit, that my target area. We stress the cone, we're going to stress the cone throughout. Our number one rule. Real quick, I'll go through our five major sub rules deriving from the cone. Angle. Some people think all flint napping just derives from angles, so angles are important. Platform. There's others who think the platform or your striking surface is the most important rule in flint napping. They're all important. They all come together. A slice of a cone, just a partial, less than a half. We've
touched on it, we'll go into it again. Number four would be the curl. Your flake does not travel flat. It curls. Number five of the major rules is your direction of travel. Your energy travels the direction of the blow. Angles are critical, of course, in flint napping. The angle from where we want to remove a flake compared to the surface we're going to be striking. If we use our cone and we lay the surface we want to remove on the cone, and then we see from our direction of energy coming down, we don't have anything to strike on. But where if we move it up to where we have something solid to strike, our energy would go too deeply into the stone. So this angle here is generally spoken of in flint napping is to be 90 degrees or less to remove. And that's always a plus or minus. You can always remove an over 90 degree and there's a lot of times you can't remove a less than 90 degree. Once you determine that you have, through this rule, an angle where your flake will shoot here and yet you still have something to strike coming down here, now we need to determine this angle Put that in relation with your blow. Even though it appears the rock is coming straight down, it's not. When I swing, it's on an arc. When I actually strike the stone, I'm arcing out slightly. If I move the stone down, and then I might be swinging back in. When I flint nap, what I like to do is lock the hand that is holding the core rock so it's pretty steady it's pretty stable I further help my stability by locking my elbow to my side so that stays pretty constant because you the more you freehand more likely you are to move something even by locking at one point my leg my arm and at another point my elbow to my side or my hip and watching closely my striking on videotape something always moves something's not constant so there's a lot of human error going on here so the angle of the blow in relationship to the angle of where your flake is going to be removed we try to get that as stable as possible. We're going to talk platforms now. Platforms is nothing more than the surface of the flint type rock that we're going to strike with our hammer stone. It took me a long time to understand when people were talking about platforms, just what they were saying. I think I've got a grip of it. I'll pass it to you right now. It does, of course, stem from our cone. So we'll work with that a little bit. Back to the drawing board for a moment. Cone. It's our pane of glass. Our energy, our cone. Everything goes back to this cone. Our platform in this case is our top of the pane of the glass. These rules are dictated to us by physics, the laws of physics. When our energy comes down, it strikes this pane of glass or our obsidian at 90 degrees, folks. So what we need to do, if we know that this angle of the cone is 120, give or take, well, that leaves us 30 degrees here. In flint napping, that doesn't really work. Let's pursue this. Now, we'll transfer some of that paperwork over to our rock. And one thing I found through the years breaking rock, watch myself on videotape, is generally speaking, the 
plane where I want to remove a flake is parallel to the ground. Give or take a little bit here, depending on the length of the flake I want. If I want to run a long flake striking on this surface, I would hold it approximately like this. So it's not quite parallel, it's, it's up a ways. Now my blow is going to be coming down at an angle like this on a piece of glass where our BB is struck it'll be running 90 degrees to our blow. In reality when I'm removing these flakes I like my platform to be stronger so I want my angle to be from platform striking surface to flake removal a little less than 90 degrees, 90 degrees will work. I don't want to get below 45. If I go to 30, like what our diagram shows us, it's too weak for me. It's really hard for me to strike a long flake off of this because this, my platform, at the angle, if I put my flake removal parallel to the ground, and I strike here, I don't have the surface to strike. I need that to be more in line this way. And then that puts this off, I shoot shorter flakes. When I have a weak platform, weak surface to strike, I can't strike this to remove a long flake. There's nothing to hit. It'll crumble. I have short flakes. What I'll do is turn her over, remove several short flakes to give me then a surface here that is more solid, more to the proper angle, 70 degrees maybe, to strike a flake across through here. Confusing, yes. This will come around as you see me repeating this, removing flakes throughout the video. Another point to make now on platforms is I need a good, clean surface to strike. So I don't have high spots or a bunch of low spots to take away from where I want to direct my energy. A quick look at this surface illustrates what I'm talking about. There are so many irregularities that to strike here over to here, I don't have any idea where my hammer stone will hit. There's so many high spots, irregularities. You'll see throughout the video where I clean these and create solid striking surfaces. On this surface here, there's nothing strong enough to strike to remove a flake. Here on this, I have cleaned this surface, strengthened it, and given myself the angle from flake removal to my striking that is solid. No one is 65 to 70 degree range probably. Where if I strike here, I have something to hit to remove my flake through there. Another thing you'll hear me refer to as we go along is the isolation of a platform. This whole upper part here is strikable, it's clean, but I want to hit little corners, I want to hit appendages. That's an isolated platform. I don't want to even consider in a straight line. I can make part of this isolated by removing rock from here, 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 and then back again. Boom, 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 boom. And then I can move this isolated point further up into here. So you'll hear me refer to isolated points and I'll certainly point them out. The rock is not holding 
your flake in, your comb. You want it'll just it wants to shoot right down that line. If I tried to do that inside a straight line, I'm just being held on both sides. And I would have to gouge a hole out. And then flint napping, you cannot gouge out. What we're doing is our platforms are being set around lines, old flake scars. Flake scar here, flake scar over here, running off of an isolated platform here or an isolated platform here once I dress it up. Grinding down my edges, I've isolated this point, this point. Get rid of the weak spots. These lie right on old flake scars. Both of those are good prospects for removing flakes. A slice of the cone. What do we speak of slice? Well, we can't remove a whole comb in flint napping. We can't really remove a half a comb. We don't gouge out into the rock in flint napping. What we're doing is removing appendages. It took me a long time to realize where that cone fits in. We're just taking a piece of that cone, a small piece. The blue lines represent the typical flake. The stick coming down, hitting. What we're doing is we're just running the outside rim, edge of this cone. Right here, where it's curled. Sometimes it'd be wider, sometimes narrower. Let's take another look at our hunk of clay. See, the surface is rounded. And what we're doing is removing just a piece of that surface. We're not removing a straight line, a straight plane. That can't be done here. We're not splitting wood. We're predictably removing flakes from rock. And this is how it's done. Here's a handful of typical flakes I've picked up. I just want to point out that the surface of the flake, this surface here, is rounded. It seems to be more flat here, but there is a slight round of the outside edge of the cone. Pick a bigger flake and see what that shows us. The flake is round as the outside of the cone. The further down it traveled, actually this overshot on the bottom, it got more straight. It didn't keep the roundness of what the cone was. But this is the outside of our cone. There are varying degrees of roundness on the flake. But if an entire cone was removed, this would just be one portion of it. Flake comes from inside of the cone. The flat surface facing you, that's the outside of our cone. That's a slice of a cone. It would take one hell of a BB 
to strike this and knock a cone out of the inside of it. There's just too much mass. I don't know where the point of mass ends where you can strike it and knock a, a cone out, which has no bearing on us. What we're doing is working with the rules that work for us. That means we're moving a slice of a cone, basically skimming surfaces. Now let's work with that slice of a cone on some straight edges. Got a straight edge here. We'll hit here in the middle. We have an angle less than 90 degrees. Let's see what happens. If I hit where I'm aiming, I'll have my bulb of percussion here, and my energy will go down, and we're trying to gouge, in this case, out of the stone. It won't work. What will happen is the energy will fan out. In some semblance of that. That will come from the angle that I hold here and strike. Fanned out from point of contact. Let's look at what was left behind. Here's where we struck, trying to gouge out of the rock. It won't gouge. So it fanned out. The energy's trying to dive into that stone. And it curled out suddenly right here. And it fanned out to both sides. That's our cone at work. Our slice of cone, when we hit, was being held here. It was being held here. So instead of running smoothly down an appendage where it would just pop off, it was trying to gouge into the rock. Same results. A fan. And a gouge. Remember, we don't gouge. Sure, it's predictably removing, predictably removing a little fan-shaped knife. If you have nothing else on a stone to hit, certainly you can use this knowledge and still knock off a, a sharp edge. This is extremely sharp. But it's not where we're going. Being aware of what's going on is pretty important. You'll use this awareness in times to actually remove flakes if you're in a bind. But something to avoid when you're when you're building a biface or a big preform or an axe. Another rule. Flakes curl. They don't travel flat. When you strike a blow, the flake is removed, it curls. I'm holding the bulb in my right finger. Some curl less than others, but they all curl. No, I won't say all curl. I've shot some pretty flat flakes before. When I strike a blow, that flake is going to curl. Count on it. One of our predictabilities of flake removal. That's one reason arrowheads are built lens-shaped. 
the flakes curl right over from edge to edge. Flakes are allowed to run if you strike one edge completely to the other. In this video take, one of the goals will be to reduce a large rock down into a preform. And this will be the final shape. Now let's talk just a moment about our final major rule in flint napping. This, they're all important. The energy of your blow striking the rock transfers that energy in a straight line from the direction of the blow. Where you are striking, where that stick is coming down, that blue could be wider, could be narrower. That blue mark is your flake that's removed. All right, you're looking down the direction of the blow and the flake that's coming off. That's going to be outside portion of that cone. That's what we're taking off. Let's put it together. We're going to strike in that direction. We're going to hit a good isolated platform, angle of less than 90 degrees. From the bottom, this is what we're removing. This line, that's just this shape here. A good solid platform. less than 90 degrees, isolated, depending on where I strike here, the angle I hold the rock compared to my blow is going to tell me how far down it will travel. If I hold it up too much this way, my flake will travel out where my finger is. If I hold it too much this way, my flake will travel out back in from my lines. I can be assured I'll get a flake out of this. Everything's just too perfect. This will be in a direct relationship with the straightness of my blow. My blow will come this way. And it will cast my flake straight here. We got one line, right? What caused that? My rock turned just a little bit. See, because the top of that cone slice is going to run off whichever way I have it turned. That's the way it ran. That must be the way I held it. If I'd held it this way and hit, it would have stayed to the lines more. But by twisting the, when I struck, missing just that little bit, that put my curvature of my cone over here. Okay, I come back from the quarry, full of rock. Varying degrees of goodness here. Doesn't sound too bad. Pretty solid. Not bad. That means there's some cracking in there. Ooh, yeah. 
This will come to pieces as I bang on it. What we'll do is we'll grab a couple of these. I brought them back to, to move some flakes predictably. That's where we're going from here. Let's go get it. One precaution I'm going to take is but I'm going to pad my leg. When I get the breaking rack, even though I'm supposed to hit the rack, sometimes I miss and hit my leg. One of the projects I like to do, which requires predictably removing flakes, is replicate old aboriginal cores. This is where they've taken a flat piece of flint. And aborigines have left these behind in campsites. We find them in gravel bars and old camp campsites. Uh, I like to think that they're this is a toolbox. All flakes removed curl towards the point, towards the peak. I like to use this as an assignment, like a homework assignment for students. You can look at the core they leave behind plus the pile of flakes that they have and tell whether they know what they're doing when they strike. This again is one I've made, just a little bit larger. Nothing really spectacular about any of them. What they have behind is I like to refer to it as a toolbox. If you need a tool, you can strike any place on this core. You've got isolated platforms all the way around here. Basically, they all curl down so that you can go almost any place along the edge of this core choose the type of flake that you want, whether you want a, a wide, thin one or a, a, a wide, thick one for scraping or a, a one kind of flat to make an arrowhead out of, depending on what you want, cutting or uh, slicing into thin notches or wide notches or scraping wood or scraping hides. You can get this. Any place on this surface you can strike, and remove some sort of flake. Sometimes they break too. So you just got a pocket full of knives. You use the edge of this for whatever purpose. When it dulls up, isn't good anymore, you, you can discard it. So let's make a core. This is the piece of stuff I picked up at that quarry. Now, where am I going to use my core surface? I use this. I got a uh, concave surface surface here, so it'll be easier for me to find less 90 degree angles going down to my point. If I use the other side, yeah, it's I could make it work. This side lends itself. I use what's in my favor. First thing I'm going to do, following our cone. All our rules we've been to is I'm going to find my corners. Boom. I'm going to hit off wherever I can get, trying to drive wide flakes deep into my core to start getting me a pointed surface. Every time I get a flake off, I've got tools. I know what I'm doing. I'm predictably reducing this core down using the rules we followed. I've got that corner removed. This will be the worst one. It's got a lot of cortex or limestone around the surface. Let me try to get rid of some of that in a roundabout way. Getting rid of stuff that made it more difficult for me to shoot my flake. I still have a more than 90 degree here. I've got a less than 90 degree here. I'll pop this corner, shooting my flake that direction. The less than 90 degree. That's a little less, not a lot less. It would be easier for me to take this flake off if I come at it from another angle to isolate that a little bit more. 
This is workable. It'll be workable better when I get to it. Another problem I'm running in on this stone, which I got rid of most of it, but there are some internal fractures. There's a lot of that in this flint that we have here. You'll be working along, think you're getting a pretty good piece going, then boom, you don't. I'm going to work into this corner through here. Making cores is fun. Size educational. Got through the worst part here. The smaller it gets, the harder it is to maybe end up with a finished product. I've still got two sides that are squarish. One's got a lot of limestone on it, so there's not enough good solid flint to hit this corner. I can come from the other direction to open that up. It's not cheating. What I did is I got rid of almost all limestone. There's no flint hardly at all in there. And that took care of a lot of my excess of 90 degree angle. Oop, got some fractures coming into here. I got a little deep on this. I can correct that because of my surface down below here to get rid of this overlip, which is dry, the opposite direction from what my flakes want to run. Little short flakes. It gets a little bit straighter. It'll help me out. I'm taking short flakes here because it's an overhang. It, my edge comes out. I just soon it be more smooth without that little dip. We're getting in on our final corner. We got some problems because we got a fracture coming through here. We got that fracture running down. We got some limestone. And I've got myself a step started here that I can't shoot through that. From the back end, I come from the bottom, come up, and probably come through that step. Maybe next time. This is tough. Here's part of your platform problem. I want to hit on this lower surface, but I've got this fracture line, which gives me a higher surface that's getting out of where I want to hit, but I want to hit back in. So where I want to hit is too close to this line. I don't think I can, because I need a good angle, a good angle coming down to strike to drive my blow in through the rock. Tricky. That's what these are for, to overcome. We'll try it. A real accurate blow and see if it works. Yes, it did. That fractures left me some real odd angle here to try to correct. Okay, now, I've got one major obstacle. I've got a step here. If I direct my energy through here, along this ridge line, if I strike somewhere in this area, directing my energy this way, I've got enough clear stone to hopefully take me through a portion of this step.
and leave me a little enough of it left to repeat that. Let's try it. Nope. One more blow. Yes. Maybe nothing very pretty, but this would be my toolkit. I could carry this with me. Or set it on the windowsill as a paperweight. So what do I end up with? A good exercise in predictably removing flakes. A whole passel of good usable flakes. And my toolkit. Now I want to work a little on doing a bifacial core, or a preform. And by that I mean something like this. I roughed this out at the quarry yesterday, just freehand, and it's just a quickie. I'm not as likely to get a piece like this from a big old clunky piece. What I'm looking for is a width to thickness ratio. It's quite a bit wider than it is thick. This would be a good one. Probably not to do one quite this big. But there's a preform not far from this size within this rock. Or this one. Something a little thinner might be a little easier to work with. I need my piece to be solid and ring, not be a dull, clunky sound. It'll be it'll be easier for me to turn a bifacial preform out from something that's wider than it is thick. This is no, oh, this is workable. I can knock some bigger flakes off to begin with. So let's choose one and go after it. little hollow ring to it. There's probably some faults in it. I don't have too much of that rock over there that, that doesn't. As with a core, this is an assignment, a lesson plan for me. And I'll look at a piece and I'll envision what I'm trying to do is make this piece first a bifacial preform. Right here. Bifacial is just flakes removed across both surfaces. Now, this, like my core, I could carry this with me as a toolbox. I could use it as a tool. It's thick enough yet to remove some flakes, and I can refine it down as I go and turn it into scrapers, knives, axes. It is kind of a hand axe right now. And eventually turn it into a finished dart point, spear point, arrowhead. Uses in, a lot of uses in here. But my assignment for me is to turn my chosen piece into is first off a bifacial preform. Secondly, from there, to turn that into as wide, as long, and as thin a piece as I'm capable of doing. I don't have a style I'm trying to replicate. I'm not trying to make a corner tang knife or uh, a, a fluted clovis piece or any particular style of anything. So here I would likely use this as end to end. This is my width. Why? It will be harder for me to remove flakes looking at the rock this direction. I don't have any really prepared surface to start with where on this side I do. So I can drive longer flakes. Every time I thin this, Every time I'm thinning this rock down, I'm making it smaller, narrower, or shorter. I'll probably be able to remove less material to start with for my thinning this direction. And since it's pretty much a square rock, or a square piece, I would say I'll end up with a piece, oh, something like that. And probably no thinner than that. 
We'll see. It's kind of a little test here. Let me mark out on this piece of cardboard, my little notepad. There's the length I predicted. There's the width I predicted. We'll try to see how close to that final size I can get. I'll work primarily with the hammer stone, probably some with the baton, whatever. What you're interested in is not necessarily the tool I'm using, the way I'm using it. The rules that I'm following. And I'm going to be removing flakes off this surface using this is my platform. I'll be striking. Flakes come from the underside of where you're striking. So I'll follow scars. I've got a scar here. I've got an end scar here. But what I'll have to do is make short flakes to begin time. I'm going across the flat surface. My first series of flakes will be shorter than my second. So eventually, the middle of my rock will be my high point. And I'll, again, at some point come from the other direction. Remember, one flake at a time, and you can't put them back. It'll strengthen my striking surface to begin with. And I'm going to drive for my edge. Kind of rounded through here a little bit. Left myself a nice step, which I'll work through later. A step is where the flake goes in and stops. The energy's going too deep. A stack is a series of steps. So if I continue hitting into this from this direction, I'm going to compound it. So in my working, I will get rid of this or work through it just a slice at a time. I believe it would be a good idea for me to strike on this surface again, starting at this end, or get a good clean shot, and try to remove some heavy, thick flakes. Follow my scars up. Starting at one end, where that cone will release. Like so. Now, that terminated on me suddenly in here, but it went through some frost scars. To keep that from happening again, I'm going to try to remove that. Oh, bad spot in the rock anyhow. Got rid of that. All right. I've got a good line to follow. Let's just keep her going. Yep. See, I've got some internal fracture lines in here. They're going to mess with me. We're hoping we can get through them. Ah, it's right down the middle. Good ones. I'm going to try it. Right down through here, I've got a ridge scar, I've got a step. If I hit far enough back into the rock, I'm hoping I can shoot right through that step. Yes, I did. Didn't go very far, but I went through it. Cleaned it up. I've almost, if my biface center line lengthwise runs here, I've got a curl shape coming into it already from this surface. Good start on it. This one is set up for it. I just don't have a surface to strike. I don't have that platform. We'll get into that. Grab me a different little stone here. Now this could all be done with one stone, which is like mechanics going to do his best tools if he's got a good thorough toolbox. All right, I'm just going to get rid of some of this high corner with short flakes. I can't drive long flakes through here. So, and I don't really have much for platforms. I got right at 90 degree running off of this surface in. And I got a little less than 90 running from this surface in. We'll take some short ones, get rid of some of that. In turn, what that'll do is run this edge line up here more, which makes it easier for me to set up platforms to shoot flakes back the other way or even back this way. Right now, I don't have anything but some short flakes to come off.
Still not ringing. There's something in there yet that's not working right. I'm going around where I have less than 90 degrees. And taking advantage of those natural platforms. Also, right now, trying to get my rock to come apart through my seams. Still got something in there. I got a little less than 90 right here. If I can shoot a flake along here, it will give me something to shoot back over here. We're shooting pool here. Playing chess. Setting up what we're doing. By removing that flake, that allows me to turn that rack over and have a striking surface here to direct my flake wherever I might want to. Probably along this edge to start with. But then I'll turn it again eventually, maybe, and then back and forth. We'll see. Okay, that one went pretty good. It went quite a ways along my rock. This is where I was driving flakes here. You can turn that over, and now I've got some good 45 degree plus or minuses to set some flakes off along this surface. Back on that same angle. The opposite side now to try to set my platform up to come back. I can hit this point here along here. But whatever it does, what it's going to do is leave me something to come back and strike on. Now this is a weak edge, a weak angle. Before I hit that, I want to strengthen it by removing flakes back and then forward. I want to get rid of anything that's just weak. I'm going to distract my blow from driving the flake I want. Ooh. I've got them going a good length here of my surface, but now I'm getting in that little peak here. I can't go through that. So I'll drive short ones here to get rid of that peak. I don't need anything fancy. What I want is a clean, smooth transition with my center being higher than my edges. Then I can have my lens shape to drive flakes predictably longer. Here I've got a surface here. It doesn't lend itself is a platform from either direction. If I strike that surface here on the end, which I do have something to strike, I can remove some of this and leave me a platform to shoot back over on this side. Let's go after that. Then, by removing that, I've got a good surface to strike here and to drive a flake out. And it's solid enough. I've got some chattering through here. That's mostly fracture marks. And I can shoot. If I hit this good, I can with enough weight or energy, I could probably drive kind of along this ridge line, directing my blow that direction cut through some of these fracture scars coming in from the side. This might be a little small stone for me, but let's see. Well, I got something. What do we get? Well, it went where I want. Got rid of the scars. But we're gaining. Now, I can come back and strike this surface here to remove that to give me a surface to come back on this side to strike another blow along that ridge line left from my last blow on that side. I'll clean this up a little bit more and isolate it. Remember our rules. That's about what I was after. Angle was off a little bit. The energy into the stone left me a step instead of smoothing, coming out smoothly. That's what I got. We'll work with it. 
Our next series of flakes are not going to go on this side, which is pretty much venticulated. <laughs> Big word, huh? Uh, lenticulated. Now, I don't know one of them words. Lens-shaped. It's kind of jagged yet. Now, these are not for me. Some of this, this step here is, but there's fracture scars in here. So I am not doing all this. I want a striking. Right now, I don't have anything to hit here to drive my flakes this side here. I just have nothing but pointed surfaces. So I need to get rid of those. I don't have to do the whole line at one time, but I need to get rid of something to get me started. I just bang around a little until I open up. Doesn't need to be a large area. Remember, my blows are going this way, shooting flakes that way. And I'll vary that until I remove what I'm after. I do have an opening to hit here and remove a flake out into here. Then that will help me set up more platforms along here. Okay, got a little one out of there. Don't need to be big. I'm just getting rid of the rest of that corner that was right there. Now remember, I'm looking to shoot flakes off this side, the back side right now. I need a surface to strike. At right angles to my blow. Strike just a little right here. Use a little bit of that scar, there's not much of it, and take my next one off. Now I'll use the fact that I can get to this point now without an edge being in my way and set myself a platform up to strike in here. have a spot here to step I left behind, but a line here, high point here, I should be able to shoot right through there, like so. This edge begins to become more lens shaped, which makes what was a little bit nicer surface look a lot crummier now. I still have this whole side to get into. We'll work on that. This is one of my ends. Get through some of that to try to solidify what we have left behind. So I'll be shooting flakes, short flakes, from here into here. Just opening up some extra scars, too. It's all right. We need to find out where they're at. I had a friend tell me one time, just recently that if all he had to work with is the flint we had here in Kansas, he'd move. <laughs> yes, sir. Now you see some of why. This edge here is being lowered a little bit to get me closer to shooting a good flake on this side. So what I'll do is I'll take a hit here to try to bring that line down a little bit more to give me a surface, a platform left behind to drive over here. Now we're starting to get into another rule, which is the center line of the stone. It's starting to come into play now. You've got, this pretty well shows you where the center line of our biface is going to be. Well, I can drive longer flakes if my center line edge here of my platform is closer to the side I'm trying to drive the flake off of. And of course, if you paid attention to our rules, if the rules are sinking in, you'll understand that because of the angle. Right now, for me to strike this surface right here to get my longest flake possible, 
I'd have to strike down about like this, which would send my cone off about like to here. If I can move that line down further, I should be able to drive a longer flake because my angles will be better. I'm trying to lower this line for a platform to shoot this way. So I've lowered this, oh, an eighth of an inch or so, maybe a quarter of an inch, which gives me more of a surface to strike here with the proper angle to drive maybe a little longer flake. I'm going to hit right on this corner. I'm going to drive my flake along a little bit of a scar, ridge scar here. It's not very much, but enough to guide my flake in. It'll widen out. This remaining here is not too whoopy because it's going to go into some chatter. That got me through a little bit of trouble. Got me out of a little bit of trouble by going through some trouble. So this whole surface is starting to get lens shaped up for us. I've got a problem right now with this fracture here. That's a real fracture in the stone. And I could clean this up and have something to strike here. I'm just afraid that my energy won't go through this yet. If I can get the line here, my platform, closer to that frost fracture or fracture line, the closer it is to it, the better chance I have of shooting through it. That's good and isolated. But I'm just having a problem with that one little almost like a seashell but it's not it's an actual fracture I'm going to stair step bang a little off one side a little off another along this edge to hopefully give me a bit more control so I can run some better flakes I picked that point for my first blow try to direct it as much as I can along that ridge line. That's the direction I'll be striking. So, in order to have a better chance of hitting it, I'll get rid of what I can in here. My strike will be in here. The aim of my blow has to be this direction. That's just where the top of my cone is going. And as it goes, it should, I'm hoping, come down and take some of this right angle surface with it. You got a little understanding of that? <laughs> Let's try it. Okay, we'll replicate that. Boom, I hit here, aiming where that arrow is pointing and it spread out from that point that was my direction and I got a little bit of that 90 degree surface out not a lot but you don't sometimes have to peck a little at a time to get to it I'm going to leave that be for a moment and go to this end I've got kind of a squarish corner but I've got an angle on this surface down. See, that's over 90. I also said you can take flakes off over 90. And I'm going to knock this corner off. Got part of it. So by removing that corner, I leave myself a little bit less than 90 to come back onto. I really want to strike off of here to open this area up for me, isolate it some more. 
but I would want to come this direction. But my striking surface for that would be way over here. So first I have to at least take one off of this side by striking here to give me any chance at all of coming up on this side. Now I want to hit here to get rid of this. Now my whole purpose of what I'm doing, this is my length of my piece. The whole purpose of what I'm doing is to isolate this corner here that I'm having trouble getting into. So I'm sacrificing some of what I have for length. I think time, remember? I've got a little pop here that can drive some off of up here. Get a bigger wrench. I am getting this corner pecked into a little at a time. I've got a little chatter here. That really interferes with me striking here along this line. I'll hit far enough back on this platform. Good solid hitting surface. Pretty isolated. Less than 90 degrees. I can shoot through my chatter. If I hit close to the edge, I'll compound my problem. And I'll peck off another little bit. And we'll continue pecking away until this side has an edge where we can pick and choose our striking surfaces. Just like the rules. We've pretty much got control of this rock now. I got some jagged stuff up here. I got some jagged stuff down here. A few fracture lines right in there. And a step I left over here. I'm getting some control here. I'm starting to get it lens shaped. And I've been trying to thin it as I've been going also. But at this point, I'll try to get a bit more serious and try to drive a little bit longer flakes. Well, my flakes, if I can do it, to go beyond center so that I will thin it faster than I narrow it. Here's my obvious trouble spot here, another one here. Neither one are ready yet for uh, a blow. And let's kind of mark in our imagined finished core. Give us some sort of an idea as we're striking along. So this side's my best side. So we'll let this side rest. We'll take it. Take our shots here as we get them. We'll concentrate on cleaning this side up. I'm going to shoot one from here and try to run something off in this direction. To do so, I need a platform. Got a good, solid, pretty clean platform striking surface here. To run one, we're kind of like shooting up the length. Now we'll strengthen this up. I've got a scar I've left here from my last blow, and we'll try to follow that somewhat. We'll spread out from that, but. The direction of my blow is not exactly straight up this scar. I'm going to strike in here and run it off from that scar a little bit, but the top of that cone will still be enough that it will want to follow that. But I smoothed my surface. I'm trying to open it and smooth it from whatever area I can to get to this crappy area. So that's the bad end there. This is where I've been working. 
So an obvious strike right now would be off of here, but it's not isolated. So I'll take a blow off of this surface here and bring a flake off into here. See, I'm afraid no matter when I hit this, it's going to stop right there. I want this as smooth across here as possible before I take that shot. Because if it's running into rough ground over here, it's more of a likelihood that it's going to stop here. So I'll work to smooth this surface up as much as I can before I take my shot. You'll note, if you haven't, let me point it out, your accuracy of your blow is important, so what I do is I pull my rock up to where I'm going to strike it till it hits, and then I bring it a little closer together because I know that my blow actually is hitting further down the stone. So I'll bring it up to make contact, and then I'll push it up a little bit more and blow off. I'm trying to clean a platform here for the strike for the strike across up here. And I've just got a little bit of stuff in my way yet. This ain't too bad. If I strike right in there, so I'm pinpointing. I'm having to get awful choosy here. The smaller it gets, the fewer mistakes I can make. Now I've got this area out of my way, basically, and thin, drove long flakes to do that. What I've been aiming for is to get into this area to shoot flakes across here. But I needed to get rid of this, to clean this up, so that I could better prepare and isolate platforms through here. And not only that, I have to thin as I go. Now, my next flake that follows this line is not going to go lower. It's not going to dig deeper. If I want a, f a blow from here, a flake from this side, to go lower than what I have here, I actually have to go back, start over, and run a series of flakes up to thin this. This has to be lower. Because as it goes along, it's going to get higher. We're not gouging out. Remember that. If that didn't make sense now, it will when you go to work. I've pretty much taken this whole edge and toughened it up. Moved the center line to this side to dry flakes. I'm going to change tools now and go from my rock, my hammer stone, to a billet. I just, at a certain stage, I find that the billet seems to have more control for driving the longer flakes. And I'm going into some tough country up here. I want all the help I can get. My first blow, I'm going to shoot mostly out here. Okay, we're going to try changing the camera angle here a little bit too. You're going to get a, a little bit more of what I'm seeing. Still not exactly. 
when I'm striking. I've got just a little high point right here. That's going to interfere with my striking. I'm not trying to follow my flake scar here. I'm thinking more of shooting in like this because I want this area here as low as I can get it. So by shooting a flake more this way, I can lower this, which will leave this area as high as possible, which will help run the flake further. I'm looking for my next oh, one or two blows down the road to drive a long one all the way through over into here. It's just going to help me. I've got some real problems there. So by removing initially across the flat plane, you can see where this is getting from thinner to thicker as it goes up. And that's just the way it works. You can't gouge into that stone. So for me to get thinner here, I need it thinner here. So I'll try to remove more here. But I've got, in order to have a good striking surface, I need to get rid of that little booger. There we got it. Where I want to strike is right there. I've got that little high point right here. It could interfere. That could take part of my blow. Okay, we cleaned her up. That's my point. That's where I'm going to strike. It's not very, doesn't seem very isolated, but it is. I just want to remove a little bit through here to help me out on my next blow or two blows away, which is going to be through that mass. And support of your rock comes into play here especially the thinner you get. I'm letting the rock rest comfortably. So when I strike, it'll dance, it'll bounce. The thinner you get, the more problems you have, but if you hold it really tight down, you hit, that rock can't move. The energy's going through the stone, it can break your rock in two. So I find my support is basically not supporting it just holding it in place so when I hit it I'm not holding with anything my it's resting against my pad in my rear fingers and when I strike it it's allowed to flow with the energy and hopefully not give me a problem to help isolate this mass in the center more I'm going to take a blow from the end through here. Okay. There are some frost to fracture lines in here. They don't go all the way through to this side. I want to remove this part here to give me a lot better opportunity of shooting through there. I don't need this to be much of a flake. Just want it out of there. So what I've done is I've narrowed this, my platform. I've got rid of some of the mass above and below. I'm looking to drive as far as I can. Ideally, I'd go over into this mess. The up and down being the angle 122 degrees from my blow coming down. It's guesswork. Okay, now my flake blew apart. But this last piece is the one I was worried about. We've got this side, this whole surface, this side of this surface under our control. I can remove flakes either side. 
just my set my platform up but my problem spot right now is this we've gotten rid of the one spot that was the real problem that's gone so we've made the transition of this into something decent a little easier so I've got a surface here that I can use as a striking surface to run a flake out here direct my energy that direction now we have just this little quagmire I want to get into this mess and I don't have anything here at this end to strike on. I've got some fracture crap here that I can't get through. This, my center line of mass is on this side. It's not set for driving a flake off on this side. Here, my center line is good, but it's flat out here. To have a better chance of this platform going through and into my gobbledygook or my trash, I'd be smart to go all the way to the end. Remove a flake here, a thinner. Another thinner to get this all thinner than where I want it to re be removed eventually. That's where I'm going for. But if I try to hit this now, my chances of getting into this are not so good because I have to almost gouge. And we know we can't gouge. I thin all this to make this stand out and be higher. Easier for that flake to be released. Especially since I don't know what kind of scars are involved in there. It's not a pretty sight, as they say. Thinner one. Thinner two. Thinner three. So this worked all right. Right now my flakes are stopping at this point, a little over halfway. If I want my fourth thinning flake to go, which also could lead in to this trash, I'd be smart to come in from my other side and lower this line here. This is a little higher. And if I can drive a flake in from this side to lower just this area, I have a better chance of my flake that I strike here of going further. Right now it'll stop at this point. It won't go beyond it. Because there's not a step, but it's a ridge. I'll do that in the series again. One. Not a good one. Ooh. All right. There we go. So what that leaves me, much better shot from here up into here. This is iffy enough, I'll etch it out for us. I'll strike into here. I want my energy to go this direction. And this is the crap I'm trying to get through. This first. There we got something. Got through the trash. Oh boy, there's the end of that scar right there. There's the outline I'd done originally. And here's what I've got at present. Length is just about exact. A little bit wider. This is a preform. That's what I walk away from the quarry with. 
Say, wow, yeah, I got a tool. I mean, I've gotten rid of all that excess. I can get a lot of enough mass to knock flakes off of. I've got a tool I can use as a knife or a scraper, as it is, or an axe. Still got a little ways to thin. Again, there's the preform. So there you have just about two hours of videotape showing you the basic mechanics of how to fracture rocks. The rules presented here are what you'll need to advance on to find arrowhead making, if that's what your goal is. But with the knowledge you have, you should be able to walk out pick up a couple of rocks, make yourself a tool. You've got a pocket knife if you need one, you've got an axe if you need one, you've got a scraper if you need one. The information's here. A real wise fellow once told me that we're able to give you in a matter of hours what took us a matter of years to learn. And here for certain it is so. There's a lot that's of course not covered. There's a lot more to flint napping than just what I've showed you. This is the basic. This is your base. With this, you'll go fast to reach the peak of that pyramid. I'd like to be able to have shown you, spent more time in how to take different types of material and fracture it. It's going, if you're not interested in learning how to flint nap, it's going to be an awful long two hours. If you're really interested in learning and advancing, it'll be a short two hours. And you'll come back and go over it. You'll go out, break some rock, reach a point, say, I don't quite understand this. You'll come back, watch videos, say, oh, yeah, there it is. And you go back out, knock some more flakes off. This hasn't been put together to be an entertainment video. It's an instructional video. And now it's up to you, so have at it. Go, go break some rock.